Welcome to this presentation. My name is Carl Box, and I'm the European Chief Scientific Officer for PION, based in the UK. Today, I will provide you with an overview of the latest work and results using our fiber optic dissolution equipment and its application for the study of nanoparticulate systems. The presentation is structured in the following way. I will provide an overview of our fiber optic dissolution platform and the use of second derivative spectroscopy and how this has been applied to studying the dissolution of nanoparticulate systems. I will also look at light scattering for determining the size of nanoparticles. I will then look at some preci precipitating drug systems and the generation of colloidal species and look at their impact on flux and drug absorption behavior. Finally, I will end with a summary and some conclusions. So let's make a start with a look at the microdisc profiler, the platform we have used for studying nanoparticular systems. The microdisc profiler is an eight channel small scale dissolution platform that consists of the mini bath and rainbow spectrometer. The mini bath is used for magnetic stirring and temperature control. The rainbow spectrometer consists of a deuterium light source connected to eight fiber optic UV probes and eight individual spectrometers. The fiber optic probes are introduced into microdisc profiler vessels and can be used to determine concentrations of drug substance during experiments by using UV spectroscopy. The platform has been used in early drug development in multiple applications. These range from intrinsic dissolution rate measurements using compacted discs of drug, looking at drug precipitation risk when transitioning from a gastric pH environment to an intestinal pH environment, investigating the use of excipients on drug supersaturation behavior, studying the impact of bioirrelevant media and simulated intestinal fluids on dissolution and solubility, and drug flux and absorption studies across biomimetic membranes, amongst others. In today's presentation, I will look at some recent studies on nanoparticulates and colloidal systems. The advantage of fiber optic concentration measurements for studying many of these dynamic dissolution processes is that it overcomes many of the challenges of traditional testing methods, which use external sampling of the test solutions. This could include sampling errors due to filter clogging, mechanical sipper malfunction, sample contamination, absorption of compound to tubing, in addition to incorrect sample preparation and storage of precipitating drug systems. These are avoided by the use of in situ fiber optic dip probe UV apparatus, since the concentration measurements are performed directly in the dissolution media with process results plotted in real time. Spectral scans from 200 to 720 nanometers of all channels takes less than five seconds. Also, it's worth pointing out that any interference that might arise from background turbidity in studying today's poorly soluble drugs or the use of insoluble excipients or some bioelevant media can be minimized when needed by a spectral second derivative method. The top picture here shows a plot of a UV spectrum showing direct UV absorbance versus wavelength. One of the graphs is a fully solubilized standard solution of a soluble drug. The other shows the spectrum obtained in turbid solution where light scattering causes an apparent shift in the baseline. There are many examples of applying baseline correction algorithms to UV data, such as simple baseline correction to more complex polynomial fits. However, as the bottom graph shows, the patented Pion second derivative UV spectroscopy approach provides a very useful technique for overcoming and correcting turbidity. Also, it should be pointed out that Beer's law for concentration determination also applies to second derivative spectra. In the next section, I'll provide an introduction to nanoparticle dissolution and look at some nanoparticle suspensions. In a collaboration with, Bas with Novartis in Basel, Switzerland, and the proxin nitro suspension was prepared by suspending micronisin proxin in the mixture of hydroxypropyl cellulose, sodium dodecyl sulfate, and deionized water. 
and then the suspension was then prepared by further reduction of the particle size using wet media milling. This was shown to be a stable system with a long shelf life. It had a mean particle size of 153 nanometers and a narrow polydispersity index. It is worth pointing out that the intrinsic solubility of the untreated crystalline API was 16 micrograms per milliliter. The supposed advantage of nanoparticulate systems is an increase in solubility, and this is one of the things we wanted to investigate. In this slide, we show a picture of UV spectra collected in eight dissolution vessels using all eight of the fiber optic UV probes. Aliquots of naproxen nanosuspension were injected into each vessel at concentrations levels below and above the solubility limit of naproxen. At concentration levels below the solubility limit, the solution would be totally clear and the baseline would be horizontal. At concentrations above the solubility limit, the naproxen would be unable to fully dissolve and light scattering of undissolved material would lead to a sloping baseline. The UV spectrum at the top left shows the fully dissolved drug. The corresponding second derivative spectrum is displayed on the bottom left. The concentration was 12 micrograms per milliliter below the crystalline solubility. Also indicated on the second derivative spectrum are two specific wavelengths where the Y value is zero. These are referred to as zero intercept points. The next graph on the top right shows the second derivative spectrum of the naproxen suspension at a concentration of 30 micrograms per milliliter, which is above the crystalline solubility. The graph on the bottom right shows both of the second derivative graphs overlaid. Note that at the zero intercept points previously highlighted that there is now a signal due to suspended nanoparticles that haven't fully dissolved. This is interesting because it shows that the drug nanoparticles themselves absorb UV light. So here are a series of overlaid second derivative spectra at increasing aliquot additions of naproxen nanosuspension. The nanoparticles do not fully dissolve and the second derivative UV response increases with each addition of the suspension. It turns out that we can use this data to construct a calibration curve for the undissolved particles. Hence, we obtain two calibration curves, one for dissolved drug and the other for undissolved suspension. Extrapolation of the undissolved solids curve also provides a direct measurement of the solubility of the naproxen nanosuspension. It turns out to be 19.1 micrograms per milliliter. This is not much higher than the reported crystalline solubility of 16 micrograms per milliliter. We validated the method by injecting a 100 microgram per milliliter load of naproxen nanosuspension into buffer and recording the UV spectrum, shown on the right hand graph. The left hand graph shows the measured amounts of dissolved drug and undissolved particles alongside the expected values for each. The right hand graph also shows the deconvoluted spectra for the suspended solids and the dissolved naproxen. The measured solubility of 19 micrograms per milliliter is close to the previously reported crystalline solubility of 16 micrograms per milliliter for the untreated naproxen API. The X-ray characterization of the materials demonstrates that the nanosuspension remains in crystalline form. Hence, there is no significant advancement, no significant enhancement in solubility of the crystalline nanosuspension compared to the untreated drug. Dissolution, however, was very rapid. In this section, I will look at characterization of nanoparticle size using scatter correction algorithms. Nanoparticles absorb UV light, and this is dependent on their size. As the wavelength approaches the particle size, it is not difficult to imagine that light will be absorbed more strongly by smaller particles. This has been described by the Tyndall Rayleigh effect where longer wavelengths are more transmitted, while shorter wavelengths are more diffusely reflected by a scattering. 
So by looking at the extent of curvature of the UV spectrum in the region where the sample itself does not have any UV absorbance, it is possible to understand the contribution of nanoparticles themselves on the displayed UV absorbance. Therefore, we obtained suspended silica particles of 10 different size ranges from 20 nanometers to 700 nanometers with a narrow particle size distribution from nanocomposites in San Diego and use these as size calibration suspensions. You can see that the smaller the particles, the steeper the increase in the UV absorbance at the lower wavelengths. We fitted the data and calculated the exponent for the different size suspensions to characterize the shape and steepness of the UV absorption curves. We then use this to construct a linear calibration curve where the log of the particle size of the silica suspensions was plotted against the exponent. The blue points are based on the optical properties provided by the nanoparticles manufacturer and the blue dotted line is the calibration curve constructed from fitting these points. The orange points were excluded from the training set and were determined independently by measuring light scattering using the microdisc profiler. You can see a reasonable comparison against the calibration curve. We have used this approach in the case study in the following section. In this section, we want to look at amorphous solubility and generation of colloidal phases of, of philodipine and model drug system. It is possible to determine the amorphous solubility of drugs with the microdisc profiler by injecting aliquots of pre-dissolved drug from a stock solution into a buffer system and recording the UV spectrum. This can be done by selecting a specific wavelength in the UV spectrum where the sample itself does not have any UV absorbance or looking at the absolute absorbance area under the second derivative curve for a selected wavelength range. For successive aliquot additions, there will be a sudden break in the curve where the drug exceeds its amorphous solubility, creates a second phase and scatters light. This concentration at this point has variously been referred to as the amorphous solubility, the kinetic solubility, maximum degree of supersaturation, and the point of liquid-liquid phase separation, amongst others. It is the concentration above which the solution can no longer dissolve any more material and the second drug-rich phase is created, amorphous in nature and the precursor to any crystallization of the drug. For the example of philodipine, which is known to have a crystalline solubility value of one microgram per milliliter, the amorphous solubility has been determined as eight micrograms per milliliter in the microdisc profiler experiments. We can also use specific zero intercept points in the second derivative spectra to find out the concentration at which this second phase appears. And then we can look at the scattering information in the region of the spectrum where philodipine does not usually absorb light to determine the size of the phase separated drug rich droplets. This is shown in the next slide. This slide shows the evolution of particle sizes with each successive aliquot addition of philodipine stock solution. The drug completely dissolves even above the crystalline solubility until the amorphous solubility is reached and drug rich droplets are formed by liquid liquid phase separation. An example of a typical picture illustrating liquid liquid phase separation is shown in the photograph, although I should point out that it is not philodipine in the picture. The size of the philodipine drug-rich nanodroplets increases from approximately 50 nanometers to 300 nanometers with each successive aliquot addition. Above a drug loading of about 23 micrograms per milliliter, the nanodroplets seem to spontaneously start coalescing into larger particles and colloidal species. In the next slides, I will show the behavior of philodipine injected at two dri different drug loadings in 12 to 16 hour experiments. The first experiment is at a drug loading of 12 micrograms per milliliter where small nanodroplets are formed. The second experiment is at a higher drug loading of 30 micrograms per milliliter where larger colloidal species are formed. A 
A solution of philodipine injected at a drug loading of 12 micrograms per milliliter exceeds the amorphous solubility and small drug rich nanodroplets are formed. From the UV spectra, we can follow both the concentration of free philodipine dissolved in solution, which reaches the phase separated amorphous solubility limit of 8 micrograms per milliliter, and also the concentration of excess drug rich nanodroplets suspended in the medium. After about four and a half hours, the philodipine starts to crystallize from the drug rich nanodroplets. During crystallization, the suspended nanodroplets are consumed and the concentration falls to zero. At the same time, the concentration of free philodipine decreases and reaches the crystalline solubility value of one microgram per milliliter. In the second experiment, a solution of philodipine was injected at a drug loading of 30 micrograms per milliliter, which leads to the formation of larger nanodroplets in colloidal species which are unstable over time. We can follow the evolution of the particle sizes, which starts from about 400 nanometers and reaches 1500 nanometers after about three and a half hours. Beyond this time, the su suspended particles are too large to produce any specific light scattering effects. Soon after, philodipine starts crystallizing, and this is shown in the graph of free philodipine drug concentration in solution. Even after injecting a drug loading of 30 micrograms per milliliter, the free concentration only reached the amorphous solubility of eight micrograms per milliliter, and after about four hours started to crystallize until the concentration of free philodipine reached the crystalline solubility value of one microgram per milliliter. Larger droplets or suspended crystalline material will not contribute to any specific light scattering effects that aren't entirely eliminated by the second derivative spectral calculations. In the final section, I will present some results of flux and absorption studies using nanoparticle systems. We have an apparatus known as the microflux setup that enables us to study combined effects of dissolution, solubilization, and permeability, and to rank all the compounds and formulations with respect to their potential for oral absorption. The microflux setup consists of four sets of flux pairs containing a donor compartment and an acceptor compartment separated by a biomimetic phospholipid impregnator membrane, where permeability data has been shown to correlate to human jejunal permeability. In the example shown, we have looked at the rate of flux of compound appearing in the, in the acceptor compartment for two preparations of carbamazepine. Each preparation used the equivalent of one milligram per milliliter drug load. The top graph used pure API and shows the drug concentration in both donor and acceptor cells. The drug dissolves fairly quickly, but then converts into a lower solubility polymorph. Flux can be calculated from the slope of the line in the receiver and normalized to the area, area of the absorptive membrane. The second example shows the results of a solid dispersion of carbamazepine with the polymer Solu Plus. This has the effect of creating a spring and parachute. The donor compartment reaches a higher concentration and this is maintained for a long period of time as the polymer inhibits the crystallization process. The higher donor concentrations drive drug absorption across the membrane and leads to higher flux values and larger amounts of drug appearing in the receiver compartment. So how do flux studies translate to the study of nanoparticle systems? We have looked at the flux of, of a crystalline nanosuspension of vitriconosol compared to the flux of the untreated material and the micronized suspension. The flux of the nanosuspension is four times higher, a significant increase compared to the other two. The nanoparticles are crystalline as shown by the X-ray results. The solubility is not assumed to be significantly higher, perhaps only 10 to 20 percent, as only nanoparticles with sizes below 100 nanometers and with high curvature have been shown in the literature to have higher solubility. The initial dissolution and continual ongoing dissolution to replace permeated drug may be faster, but it's not expected to account for all of the increase in the flux. 
Therefore, the flux is genuinely higher than expected. Could it be explained by drug guessing through pores in the filter support material, as the filters are 0.45 micron PVDF membranes? This is not thought to be true. The filter support is coated with a phospholipid dodecane mixture, and the filters become completely translucent, indicating that there is a membrane coating across the entire membrane. Hence, it creates a complete barrier function. The reason for the enhanced flux could be explained by the particle drift theory, and this is explained in the next slide. The particle drift theory suggests that very small particles are able to diffuse into the unstirred water layer or aqueous boundary layer close to the membrane surface and are then able to dissolve directly across the epithelium walls. Hence, our flux experiments with itraconazole, itraconazole nanosuspensions seem to provide some supporting evidence to agree with this suggestion, whereby the nanosized particles had a higher flux than expected when compared to the larger particle preparations. As a final example, I wanted to return to the story of philodipine and look at its behavior in flux experiments. We saw earlier that philodipine liquid-liquid phase separates into drug-rich droplets at concentrations higher than its amorphous solubility. We also saw that the size of the droplets ranged from nano-sized droplets in, into the micron range before crystallization would occur. Purdue University published data on philodipine using a similar setup and a different membrane. Their data showed an abrupt change in flux behavior on addition of drug loadings higher than 25 micrograms per milliliter, which in our experiments led to generation of large-sized drug-rich droplets. Such large droplets may not show any evidence for the particle drifting effect and diffusion through the unstirred water layer. They calculated the amorphous liquid-liquid phase separator solubility at 11 micrograms per milliliter. In our experiments, we only performed flux experiments in the range where the phase separated droplets were in the nano sized range. For the drug loading of 18 micrograms per milliliter, the flux that we determined was approximately 1.3 to 1.6 times when compared to the flux of the amorphous solubility. This might also give further, evi further evidence for supporting the particle drifting theory for enhanced absorption of nano sized particles. I will finish the presentation with a summary and some concluding thoughts. We have developed a method known as the ZIM method for measuring in real time the concentration of free API released from nanoparticles without the need for particulate separation. Knowledge of zero intercept points means that it's also possible to calibrate for the amount of suspended nanoparticulates due to the light absorbing characteristics of nanoparticles. The solubility of crystalline, of crystalline naproxen nanoparticles was found comparable to the solubility of untreated powders. There is often a misconception that nanoparticles should have a, have a much higher solubility. The method was developed for effective particle size estimation based on the shape of the scatter profile they induced. And particle size assessment can be done in parallel with concentration measurements using the microdisc profiler in situ fiber optic UV technology without any additional equipment. Information about size of kinetically forming colloidal structures can help in understanding aggregation and nucleation phenomena in supersaturation solutions. And finally, the measurement of in vitro flux demonstrated increases in absorption for nanosuspensions that were greater than expected. This may provide evidence to support the concept of the particle drifting theory. Thank you for your attention today.